Please welcome Mike Flanagan. Whoa, it is bright up here. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm a self-described fire guy. And my fascination with fire began early in my life. It was my first birthday. And there is a cake, and there's a candle. <laughs> there goes my finger. And the tears start, but my finger stays, because I'm so fascinated by that fire. Um, so, and I've been fascinated ever since. I won't tell you about the story about matches in a town in southern Alberta. I'll save that for another day. <laughs> My fascination with weather started uh, shortly thereafter, and I consider myself very fortunate to work on fire and weather, two of my loves. And so, the picture here, it kind of looks like a tornado, except for there's no debris. Uh, this is Slave Lake. I took this picture a few weeks after the fire in uh, May 2011, and everything's been consumed. Um, and this is an example of an unwanted fire. Jay is correct. Fires are good and essential for the boreal forest, but unwanted fires like this are not. And we can learn a lot from history. So this is a picture from a MOTA satellite, May 2011. Uh, May 15th to be precise, and you can see the smoke from the columns. Um, this fire turned out to be the Richardson Fire, and it burned the size in the area of Prince Edward Island. It caused slowdowns in the oil and gas sector that affected national GDP, and we're going to talk about Slave Lake in just a second. But it's hard to see, but there's a little dot here. Uh, and this is just before the fire blew up in Slave Lake. And, you know, by boreal fire standards, it wasn't all that large. But like real estate, it's location, location, location. It started just outside of town, and then the southeast wind blew it right into town. So, you know, this is something that we can learn from. Um, over 400 structures were burned. About half, a third of the town was destroyed. Insurable losses were over $700 million. At the time, it was the second most costliest natural disaster behind the ice storm. Uh, Calgary flood has now surpassed that. Uh, it was very windy, which is typical. Um, and you can see the picture of the fire coming in towards town. And there was little spotting, uh, which are burning embers being carried by the wind and starting new fires. And they were spreading into town at this moment at two kilometers ahead of the fire, which makes it very difficult for, to manage a fire like this. So fire is common in the boreal forest, and you can kind of see from this diagram that, you know, if you look at the boreal forest from coast to coast to coast, that's where the fires are. We burn about two million hectares in an average year. That's half the size of Nova Scotia. The last two years, we've burned double that. And is this, you know, uh, what we can expect in the future, perhaps. But you can see there's lots of fire on our landscape. So what drives fire over a region the size of Alberta over a time period like a few weeks or a month? And these are the things you need. Fuel, that's stuff that burns. The vegetation, the needles and leaves on the forest floor, and we have lots of that in the boreal forest, so no problem there. Ignitions, uh, lightning, and people. Lightning are responsible for most of the area burned in Canada. Um, Alberta is a bit different. I'll talk about that in a bit. Weather. We call it hot, dry, and windy. You give me hot, dry, and windy, we can have a fire problem. Um, once again, Alberta is a little bit different um, than the Canadian model. And of course, there's people. And uh, we build roads and cities and clear-cut forests. And um, we manage fires, too. And Alberta Environment Sustainable Resource Development is among the best fire management agency in the world, and they do a really good job. So this is an animation. So, you know, I say, what's the future going to be like? Well, what has the past been like? And you can see in the center there, there's the year, and these are the traditional uh, blue is cold, and orange and red are hot. And you can see we're in the 60s now, 
and still kind of half and half. And then in the 70s and 80s, you start to see we're getting a lot warmer than we used to be. And, uh, you know, this is where we've been, and where are we going? And if you can click that to make this animation start, I'll be very pleased. Okay, so this is from our Canadian GCM. And once again, uh, the color codes are the reds are warm and the blues are cold. And you can see when you see climate warming, it's not necessarily universal across the whole uh, planet. There are parts of the Southern Oceans and off Labrador where there's no change or even cooling because of ocean currents. But the rest of the planet is getting very warm. And um, so we're looking at, you know, some of the models suggest a five to six degrees Celsius warming for Alberta by the end of the century. That'd be like modern day Colorado. So a significant change in the weather. Now, I get asked questions all the time. Why is temperature so important to fire? We've found through a number of studies, for the boreal forest at least, the warmer it gets, the more fire you have. And there's three reasons for that. The warmer it gets, the drier the fuels, because as the temperature increases, evaporation, evapotranspiration increases, so the forest fuels get drier. Fuel moisture is very critical, so it's easier for fires to start and spread. Unless we see a lot more precipitation, our fuels will be drier. The warmer it gets, the more lightning we get. The more lightning we get, the more lightning caused fires we get. Uh, so, once again, more fire. And of course, the warmer it gets, the longer our fire seasons. Alberta has already moved officially to start their fire season March 1st instead of April 1st, so our fire season is already getting longer. Uh, the map in the bottom, you'll see that's kind of temperature anomalies globally uh, for last summer. And you see the Northwest Territories was above normal, and also Sweden was above normal. And Sweden had the largest fire they've had since for the last 40 years. And of course, Northwest Territories had a disastrous fire season uh, in terms of the amount of fire. So here's a picture of Alberta. Alberta is different. I'm not just, I'm not talking politics here, and uh, I actually, my GIS person put the orange for the fires, and uh, <laughs> it, that's not in honor of NDP or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> so Alberta is different, okay? In Canada, temperature really does drive fires, so the hot months, July, August, or even June, that's when you get most of the fire. Not in Alberta. We get most of our fires right now in May. and. Most of the fires in Canada, most of the area you burn is from lightning, not in Alberta. It's mostly human caused. Um, now, this happens during a period after the snow goes, but before the vegetation is fully flushed out, nice and green and lush and moist. So this period, you know, two to four weeks, um, you've got dead grass and dead material. It's easy for fires to start and spread. And when it's windy, that's also good for fires. So in, say, a hot, dry and windy, it's just kind of warm, dry and windy, or mild, dry and windy works for Alberta. And so what we're working on is to predict the spring flush in vegetation. When does it green up? Uh, and it varies a lot from year to year. Last year it was really late. This year it's really early. So this is uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bobian is leading the greening up modeling. And this is an area where she's an expert and we're building new models for fire occurrence prediction to use that information so we can be better prepared for when these spring fires come. Now, I'm going to tell you that the next two weeks are critical. Uh, we're setting up. There's fires in Alberta already. There's active fires in BC. Uh, we could see a fire problem this year. So, you know, I see a warmer world which means more fire. And I would argue that this is going to be the one of the biggest impacts on Canadian forests. Those mountain pine beetle people have a good argument as well, okay? But disturbances will be important. Um, I see increased risk as we get more fire in the landscape, and not just for communities, but for industrial activity as well. Also those smoke impacts that affects human health. Um, so. There can be more incidents like Slave Lake in the future. Through modeling like this, I think we can be better prepared for spring fires. We can reduce the risk, but we can never eliminate the risk. As long as we have the forest 
and we have ignition agents and hot, dry, windy, or warm, dry, and windy, we're going to have fire. Uh, yes, fire is at the end of the road, and it's a big one. And um, I'd like to acknowledge all of the sponsors and support I get. Um, Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, of course. Alberta Environment and Sustainable Resource Development has been a strong sponsor. Uh, University of Alberta. There's websites. I'm on Twitter. And briefly, the Western Partnership for Wildland Fire is a three-way partnership between Natural Resources Canada, Canadian Forest Service, University of Alberta, and Alberta Environment and Sustainable Resource Development. And it's just spreading its wings. And check us out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is a bit of a speculative question, but spring fires are most important in this province, but spring changes with climate change and gets, I mean, I could, you know, gets pushed earlier. And do you see that even though warmer temperatures will bring on fires, will the change in sort of the onset and offset of spring alter that equation? There will always be spring fires in Alberta. Um, as long as we get the spring winds, which we do, and as long as it's dry, in some years it's dry and some years it's not, we're going to have spring fires. And it may shift earlier, and we're starting to see that already, uh, but that's still going to be a problem. Day length is a bit of an issue, but it's really the dry and the winds that are driving the fires in spring in Alberta. Can the fires actually exacerbate the problem that created them in the first place? That it, it, it's warmer, you get more fires. Do fires actually contribute to the increased warmth? Yes, uh, positive feedback. And this happens because the warmer it gets, the more fires we get. But I would argue the more fires we get, the warmer it's going to get because of the re release of greenhouse gases. And this can be significant for peatlands which you find in some wetlands. Peatlands are organic material that's 40 centimeters or more in depth, and they store a lot of carbon. That's approximately half the carbon. Work done in Indonesia suggests that peat fires there release the equivalent of 40% of global fossil fuel emissions. The peat in Alberta and the boreal forest dwarfs Indonesia. And if these, these peatlands burn already, but if they burn deeper and longer because of prolonged drought, that's a significant increase in greenhouse gases, which can make it warmer, which causes more fire, et cetera, et cetera. 